Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, event. Today we are going to talk about El Quixote, the Quixote. And uh, we are going to talk about a person who wrote a dictionary on the book, who is considered uh, among the best dictionaries written on this novel. And, um, and I was saying before, Having this person on campus is like uh, being in party, uh, be invited to your favorite musical group uh, concert or single group, uh, single concert or sport event, and get free tickets with the best seats. And I, w I am certain that I will remember this event for the rest of the, uh, uh, my life. Why? Because today we are going to listen one of the most important people in the Spanish media. He has written many books, creative writing, history, religion, editorials, uh, uh, press articles, and he has been involved in the creation of um, radio stations and uh, TV stations in Spain. And in fact, one of these, his programs at night in different uh, stations have been one of the most popular uh, talk uh, shows in the country. You have to consider that in Spain, radio is much more important than here. The main characteristic of uh, this person is his unstoppable defense of freedom of press and freedom of thinking. And he has always supported uh, democracy on decades, even if that meant to suffer. If I have to define him in, in few words, I would say he, his motto is, uh, his motto is defend, seek the truth regardless what. Um, he, uh, as I mentioned, he's a, a historian, he is, is uh, writing in, uh, po uh, on politics, religion. He speaks many languages. Uh, he speaks, for uh, instance, Russian, ancient Greek, uh, Hebrew, French, German, German, and he is now studying Japanese or Chinese. Sorry. And uh, uh, one curiosity about him is he created the, I think, the only country music radio show in Spain. He introduced us to the country music. And the name of the program was Camino del Sur. Um, uh, I want to finish uh, this uh, introduction quoting Kipling and his poem, If, that uh, says, if you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distant run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you will be a man, my son. Welcome, Cesar Vidal. Thank you very much, Susana. Thank you very much to every one of you. In the next minutes, I'm going to try to explain some uh, very curious stories related to Don Quixote or Don Quixote, if you prefer it. For example, 400 years ago, the second part of Don Quixote was published in Spain in 1615. It was a real success, but after very few years, it was totally forgotten. Don Quixote Sancho Panza, his esquire, and his author, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, were totally forgotten. The Spaniards decide to forget his best, their best novel, his most illustrious novelist. Why? Well, because Don Quixote and Cervantes, Don Quixote and Cervantes, were dissenters. And it's curious because the Spaniards could recuperate Don Quixote and Cervantes only in the last years of the 18th century after French, English, Germans, and even Russians 
were adoring the creation of Miguel de Cervantes. Why? Well, I'll try to explain why in the next minutes, but I can say now that because Cervantes and Don Quixote were dissenters, and dissenters were not welcome in the Spain of the golden centuries. The reason of Don Quixote, the confess reason to write in Don Quixote, is in the prologue of the first part, when he's telling that this is an attack against the books of chivalry. So that the books of chivalry were a kind of books where the knights were the protagonists and people could read about giants, knights, and damsels. And it's curious, like in the, in the last words of the second part, Cervantes repeats this, this book, it's only a book to attack the books of chivalry. And he's telling, uh, for my only desire has been to have people reject and despise the false and nonsensical histories of the books of chivalry, which are already stumbling over the history of my true Don Quixote and will undoubtedly fall to the ground. Vale. Well, this is not totally the truth, but it's truth that these books were very important in this time. Uh, naturally, the people who now come to the closer to Don Quixote cannot understand where, why the books of chivalry were so important. This literary gender, gender does not exist more and it's very strange that it was so important. Well, I must tell you that probably the reality TV shows or series in TV will be treated in the future in a similar way than books of chivalry. Nobody could, will understand why we were so interested in the reality shows or in TV series. But they were a very successful literary gender there. For example, Ignacio de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, mentioned in his autobiography how he was very fond of reading these books that are so-called of chivalry. Teresa de Cepeda y Ahumada, well, Saint Teresa of Avila, is relating in his life that his mother was very fond to the books of chivalry. And he made this because he was overburdened by the work at home. And this was also a way to taking care of her children. Like many fathers now put their children in front of the TV set, well, the mother of St. Teresa made the same. This was so important, and this was creating so much preoccupation in Spain. Then in, in 1531, the books of chivalry were prohibited in America. The idea is it's okay if people read them, but it has a no very good influence, so that it's better that these books cannot be read in America. Of course, the prohibition was a failure. And the people telling that these books were bad books and pernicious books not only include authors like Luis de Alarcón or Alonso de Fuente or Diego Gracián, but even the Castilian Parliament. In 1555, the courts of Castile, the Castilian Parliament, begged from the king the prohibition not only of the publication of these chivalry books, but two of the reading of the books. They were bad books. They were immoral books. Of course, I must say, the <laughs> begging of the Castilian courts of 1555 was also a failure. The Spaniards were very fond of the chivalry books like the Americans or the Western Europe's Europeans are very fond of the reality shows. Well, even humanists like Andres Laguna or the theologian Melchor Cano or the humanist Arias Montano or Fray Luis de Leon asked for the end of these books. They were not successful. When the 16th uh, century began, well, the best 
times of the Chilbury books were to come <laughs> yet. And Philip III even suppressed every legal restriction to the Chilbury books. Cervantes wrote his Quixote precisely in this age, not of resurrection, because the Chilbury books never died, but of more strong strength of the Chilbury books. And this is very important because now we can, uh, we can discover which was the target of El Quixote. Uh, in fact, I must tell you that Don Quixote is a book of ever-growing dissidency. To the people who goes to a Barnes and Noble, for example, and buys a copy of Don Quixote, Don Quixote is only one book. For example, this. Uh, not very good translation, I must say. But really, Don Quixote is, in fact, three different books. And I'm going to try to explain this. When Cervantes decide to write Don Quixote, he has the model of the exemplary novels in his mind. So that if you was an author in the 16th century, you wanted to give the people a book to enjoy, but also you wanted to teach the people something that was useful to their lives. And that's why Cervantes, for example, wrote a series of novels that were called the exemplary novels, las novelas ejemplares. Why? Because these novels did give an example to live better. For example, in one of these novels, uh, Cervantes is telling the story of a young girl who marries an old man. According to the mind of another of the authors of the golden centuries, Calderon, when this young woman was unfaithful to his husband, the solution was to kill her. She has tainted the honor of his husband so that she deserved the death. But Cervantes saw this story in a very different way. If an old man marries a very young woman, he has made a very big mistake. But you must not kill this woman. She was younger. She was less wise than you. Be compassionate. And the, and the old man in the exemplary novels only calls his wife and calls also his lover and tell to his lover, please, marry her and make her happy. Well, this was not very, very uh, fitting into the culture of the golden centuries in Spain. But this was the example Cervantes was giving to the population of Spain. Don Quixote, in the first time, was a novel to give an example to live. And probably this was only the first six chapters of the book. He's telling the story of a man who became crazy reading chivalry books. And for example, Cervantes is telling, well, this was a man, a knight, who had nothing to do, who had something of money, and who spent his time reading chivalry books. And he became crazy. Chapter one. Second, this man decided to leave his home and to become a real knight. And he, he shows very soon that he is a ridiculous man. For example, he finds in the road a poor boy who is being flogged by his landowner. And Don Quixote frees this boy. But when Don Quixote disappears, the landowner takes again the young man and he <laughs> almost kills him flogging again. So that the intentions were good, the result was tragic. And of course, when Don Quixote is facing other adventures, he is defeated again and again. And at last, after being stoned, He's taken to home, and his nephew 
and also the priest and the barber of his hamlet decide to burn the library of Don Quixote. Chapter six of the first part of Don Quixote, probably the end of the first project of Cervantes about Don Quixote, a brief exemplary novel. But Don Quixote, this, uh, Cervantes discovered that the character was really good. And there was a real stuff in the story of this man becoming crazy, so that he kept writing. And he kept writing to finish the second book, the first part of Don Quixote. And Cervantes still was a man in love with the imperial ideology of this Spain in this time. He believed in the battle against the Turks. He was a soldier fighting the Turks in the Battle of Lepanto. He believed in the need of free the captives of Spain who were living under Islamic yoke. He was himself a captive of Islamic pirates. And of course, he believed in this kind of idea of empire lived by the Spaniards. Not only this, he believed in the love to the fatherland, he believed in liberty, he believed in the need of being prudent and of keeping the vows of love. And there are many stories of love in the first part of Don Quixote. And he believed even in the need of attacking the books of chivalry. First of the second book, the first part of Don Quixote. But the years were passing by. And the life of Cervantes changed a lot. When he finished the second part of Don Quixote, an extraordinary book that you can read in an independent way of the first part, Cervantes is a very different man. He's old. He's sick. He has lost the good relationships with his daughter Isabel. He knows that never, never will be recognized in Spain as the genius he is. He knows that he is going not to receive any reward in the court of Spain. And even when he's becoming more and more ancient, he begins, he begins to remember a son that he bore when he was a young soldier in Italy. He never knew this son, but he remembered that he had an Italian lover, Silena, and he bore a son that was called Promontorio, Promontori, because the bell of the Italian, the bells of every woman, was growing when, he when she became pregnant. And Cervantes does not see the life like when he was a young man, a young soldier, a man wanting the success in the courts and in the streets of Spain. And he begins to look for a meaning to his life. And he writes like a dissenter, the second part of Don Quixote. And he sees very, very different things. For example, listen what Don Quixote, theoretically only several days after the end of the first part, is telling about the age when he is living in. Because this is not the ideal Spanish empire. Don Quixote is telling, now, however, a sloth triumphs over diligence, idleness over work, vice over virtue, arrogance over courage. My society is not the golden society I thought when I was a young soldier in Italy. My society is a society 
where sloth triumphs over diligence, idleness over work, vice over virtue, and arrogance over failure. This is not a ideal society. This is the real society. And in this real society, what do the elites, the aristocrats, for example, in the chapter 34 of the second part, Don Quixote is telling, well, they are in the mount having fun. They are not working for the goodness of the community. They are not leading the empire to bright summits. They are only in the mount having fun. Having fun how? For example, for example, in the same chapter, killing an animal that did not hurt anybody. Well, this is not a so good view of aristocracy. And not only this, the aristocrats, especially the dukes of the second parts, are parasites corrupted, who have debts, who don't work, and who mock of a poor crazy man called Don Quixote and his squire. And why? Because they believe in the idea of purity of blood. And the purity of blood is the base of the society where Cervantes is living. Cervantes has been very ironic about this. For example, in one of his playwrights, La Elección de los Alcaldes de Daganzo, the election of the mayors of Daganzo, this is a small town very close to Madrid, different candidates decide to present, to run for mayor in Daganzo. And one of them tells, I cannot read nor write, but this is not important. I'm an old Christian and I have not blood of Morris or Jewish origin. And I don't want to read. Why? Because the people who read, if they are men, they go to the quemadero, the burning place, the place where people are burned by the Inquisition. And if they are women, they can go to a place who is much worse, telling, well, maybe a place of uh, sexual fun so that I can be mayor, not because I culture a good man, but because I'm not of Moorish or Jewish descent. And it's curious, when Sancho Panza is recruited by Don Quixote to be a man who is going to be the governor of an island, Sancho Panza says, I cannot read nor write. But this is not important, because I believe in everything the Roman Catholic Church believes, and I am a real enemy of the Jews. This is a real picture of the Spanish Empire. The purity of the blood, to be sure of having not any drop of Moorish, Jewish, Indian, or heretic blood, is the base of the empire. But Cervantes doesn't believe in this in the last years of his life. For example, in the chapter six of the second part, Cervantes is telling this. The confusion surrounding lineage is great. And the only ones that appear distinguished any lustres are those that display those qualities in their virtue. Because the great man who is vicious will be extremely vicious, and the close fisted rich man will be a miserly beggar. The important is not the ascent. Of course, my society believes so. But I must tell you if a big man, with not any drop of blood coming from Jews, more Indians or heretics. Is a vicious man, 
he will be extremely vicious. And the close fitted rich man will be, in a moral sense, a miserly beggar. And this, this is not the only time that Cervantes is telling thee. For example, in the chapter 32, Cervantes again is telling that this story about the purity of the blood is totally false. For example, he's talking about Dulcinea, Dulcinea del Toboso, the damsel of Don Quixote. Cervantes has chosen El Toboso, the town of Dulcinea, with a very, a very important target. El Toboso was not a place inhabited by all Christians. It was a place inhabited overall by people coming from Moorish ascent. And Don Quixote has a damsel, and is a damsel with no purity of blood at all. But Don Quixote said, Dulcinea is the child of her actions, and that virtues strengthen the blood, and that a virtuous person of humble birth is to be more highly esteemed and valued than a vice ridden noble, especially since Dulcinea possess a quality that can make her a queen. The important is not the blood. The important is virtue. And a person who has a humble birth, even coming from Jews, even coming from Moors, is more important and more noble than people belonging to aristocracy if they have, if they have bees. Not only this, Don Quixote, even being a knight, cannot believe in the concept of honor, this concept of honor that, for example, permits the revenge. And it's, it's very clear, but the revenge is not just, is not righteous. For example, he's going to tell this. Taking unjust revenge, and no revenge can be just, is directly contrary to the holy law we profess, which commands us to do good to our enemies and love those who hate us, a commandment that, although it seems somewhat difficult to obey, is not except for those who careless forgot them for the word, and more for the flesh than for the spirit. Because Jesus Christ, God and true man, who never lied, nor could he lie, nor can he be our lawgiver, said that his joke was gentle and his burden light. The idea of Cervantes and Don Quixote is very different. And that's why Cervantes not only doesn't agree with the role of aristocracy, but he doesn't agree with the role of the Roman Catholic Church giving legitimacy to the purity of blood. Cervantes was not a Protestant. Probably he was not a person related to Erasmus the Rot of Rotterdam, how some people say, but he was a person with a very independent view of the things. For example, again, in the second part of the book, a very different book, Cervantes makes a game with the fight of Don Quixote against the giants. Probably the most known adventure in Don Quixote is when Don Quixote attacks the windmills thinking that they are giants. But of course, they are only windmills. It's curious how in the second part of Don Quixote, Don Quixote himself is telling that the true fight against giants is to kill the pride, the envy, the wrath, the lust, and the laziness. And this is a very spiritual view of life. The most important is not attack these kind of giants that appear in the chivalry books. The most important is to defeat our interior, our inner giants. 
the laziness, the wrath, the hate, etc. And Cervantes is not an anti-clerical, anti-clerical author, but it's very curious how he criticized in the second part of Don Quixote the clergymen, the friars, the nuns, the priests, and the only spiritual man in the second part of the book is a man who is not a clergyman, is the knight of the green coat, a layman. Very, very interested in the Spain of the Counter-Reformation. In this, in this word, and this is a word based upon the purity of the blood and legitimized by the Roman Catholic Church, Don Quixote and his squire, Sancho Panza, wait for the triumph of their hopes. They believe that they can win in the battle against the evil. In, in a different way, Don Quixote believes that one day he can make that an ideal related to the golden age will triumph in the society. And Sancho Panza wants to escape from an ocean of poverty and to become governor of an island. And this is, this is the mark of a genius to me. They believe that their triumphs will be the mark of the triumph of the good over the evil. And Cervantes is going to tell, you can have what you have dreamed. And this does not mean success. This does not mean victory. This does not mean triumph. And this is the paradox in the second part of Don Quixote. In fact, Sancho and Don Quixote are defeat when they have what they have dreamed. Let me explain this because I think this is the key to understand the whole Don Quixote. Sancho Panza, in the second part, becomes the governor of the island Barataria. He has dreamed about this during the first part of the novel and the second part. But when he becomes the governor, he suffers as never before in his life. They mock upon him. He is defeated by his counselors, and he decides by himself to leave the island about what he dreamed in the past. He decides to live his dreams. Goodness, what absurd to believe it, cannot defeat evil. It's the same with Don Quixote. He becomes famous. He defeats in a duel the knight of the wood. He challenges the lions. He believes that Altisidora was in love with him. He rides in Clavileño, the magical wood horse. But he is defeated also. And what happened when they are defeated? When they discover that goodness cannot defeat evil? Well, this discovery does not annihilate them. This discovery does not corrupt them. This discovery purifies them. Sancho is going back to his Hamlet, telling that freedom, even when you are poor, is better than riches when you are corrupt and you are a slave of power. And he has discovered that even, even in the defeat could be a meaning to life. It's very important because when he's going back to his hamlet, he discovered an old friend, a man who is of Moorish, a Morisco, a Moorish ascent, and who in a hidden way is coming to Spain back because he has been expelled from Spain, but he cannot live outside Spain. And Cervantes tells a lot of things in a very few pages. First, when this man stops in the road to lunch, he always 
shows some bones of ham. Why? Because if anybody sees you with some bones of ham lunching, they think, certainly, this man is not coming from Jews or Moors. So that the passport to travel through Spain are some humbles, humble bones of ham. But also this man says something that is very important. I was in Germany. I couldn't stay in Germany because it's not my fatherland. But in Germany, I discovered that there is freedom, not as in Spain. But the Germany that the Morisco Ricotte is telling about is the Protestant Germany. The fatherland of the foes of the counter-reformation in Spain, the fatherland of the heretics. And he couldn't stay in Germany, but really, believe me, Sancho, there's freedom there. There's freedom of conscience. And this is a very sweet thing to enjoy. And so, so, this kind of faith that Don Quixote and Sancho defeat, but not defeat, after failure, but having a sense of life, a meaning of life, is discovered in these moments. For example, in the chapter 66 six of this second part, Don Quixote is telling something really curious. What I can say is that there is not fortune in the world. And that the things that happen in it, whether good or bad, do not happen by chance, but by the particular providence of heaven. Which is why people say that each man is the architect of his own fortune. I have done that with mine. Sancho, the word has a meaning. It's possible that people cannot see the meaning in life. But there's a providence after the curtains pulling the strings of the light. And what can, can I say? In short, Sancho, I took a risk. I did what I could. I was toppled. And although I lost my honor, I did not lose, nor can I lose, the virtue of keeping my word. The man, even when the man is defeat can triumph. And this is very clear in the conclusion of Don Quixote. In the chapter 74 of this second part, Don Quixote is giving this conclusion to the story and giving the view of the meaning of life according to the dissenter Cervantes. He, Don Quixote, awoke after the length of time that has been mentioned. And giving a great shout, he said, blessed be the almighty God who has done such great good for me. His mercies have not limit, and the sins of men do not curtail or hinder them. His knees listen carefully to her uncle's words, and they seem more sensible than the ones he usually said, at least during his illness, and she asked him, what is your grace saying, senor? Is there news? Which mercies are these and which sins of man? The mercies niece respond Don Quixote, are those that God has shown to me at this very instant, and as I said, my sins do not hinder them. My judgment is restored free and clear of the dark shadows of ignorance imposed on it by my grievous and constant reading of the detestable books of chivalry. I now recognize their absurdities and deceptions, and my sole regret 
is that this realization has come so late, it does not leave me time to compensate by reading other books that can be alive to the soul. I feel this that I am about to die. I should like to do so in a manner that would make it clear that my life was not so wicked that I left behind a reputation for being a madman. For although I had been one, I should not like to confirm this truth in my death. Dear girl, call my good friends for me. The priest, the bachelor, Sanson Carrasco, and the barber, Master Nicolas, for I wish to confess and make my will. But Denise was excused for, from this task by the entrance of the three men. As soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said, Good news, senores. I am no longer Don Quixote de la Mancha, but Alonso Quijano, once called the good, because of my virtuous life. Now I am the enemy of Amadis of Gaula, and all the infinite horde of his lineage, now all the profane histories of knight errantry are hateful to me. Now I recognize my foolishness and the danger I was in because I read them now. By God's mercy, I have learned from my experience and I despise death. When we arrive to this part of the novel, only three, four, five pages to the end, it's obvious that Cervantes has gone very much far to the first target. It's not only that he has attacked the views of the Chilbury books. He has given us a new philosophy of life. As he said in the first chapter of the second part, according to the holy scriptures, who cannot lack an atom from the word, from the truth. According to this philosophy of life, and this is the philosophy of a dissenter, even in the more hostile mean, the human being has the last word to make good or bad. Even the most humble human being can choose between virtue or between sin. And don't be, don't uh, lie themselves. When you practice the vis, this is never compensated because you are rich or an aristocrat. To live according to this ideal of virtue, whose most important manifestation is love to the neighbor, is what gives a real meaning to our lives. And this is possible when we believe in a good and righteous and just and providing God. This is the final message of Cervantes and Don Quixote. This is the reason why the Spaniards believing in the golden empire cannot accept them many times. And this is the reason anyway why Cervantes and Don Quixote still today, after 400 years, are speaking to us and giving a meaning to our lives. Thank you very much.